All right, we've got attendees so we can get started. Hello everyone and welcome to Murmur Lit, an event collaboration between Community Bookstore and Murmur in Brooklyn. My name is Hal Lavinka and I'm the event director at the bookstore and I'm absolutely thrilled today to welcome the one and only George Saunders for the launch of his new book, A Swim in a Pond in the Rain, in which four Russians give a masterclass on writing, reading and life in conversation with Nana Kwame Ajay Brinya. Uh, while the pandemic has taken a toll across all of our lives, virtual programs like the one you're about to see have become bright spots in our days. And I wanna give a huge thanks to George and Nana for taking the time to join us this evening. So a little bit of housekeeping and then we'll get started. You should be able to see and hear our presenters, but they cannot see or hear you. So if you have any questions, please click on the Q&A button here at the bottom of your screen to submit them. Uh, we will try to get through as many of those as we can at the end of the program. A caveat for tonight's event and for all virtual events, we are all at the mercy of our home internet connections and server loads. So please bear with any technical issues that could arise. We will try to solve them quickly. And finally, uh, George's new book was released today and copies have already begun shipping out to you over the weekend. Um, and if you live in Brooklyn and selected in-store pickup, head over to the bookstore where you can curbside pick up your copy. So now a little about tonight's authors and we will get started. George Saunders is the number one New York Times best-selling author of 10 books, including Lincoln and the Bardo, which won the Man Booker Prize. Congratulations, by the way. 10th of December, a finalist for the National Book Award, The Brain Dead Megaphone, and the critically acclaimed collections Civil Warland and Bad Decline, Pastoralia, and In Persuasion Nation. He teaches in the creative writing program at Syracuse University. And Nana Kwame Ajay Brenya is the New York Times bestselling author of Friday Black. Originally from Spring Valley, New York, he graduated from SUNY Albany and went on to receive his MFA from Syracuse University. His work has appeared or is forthcoming from numerous publications, including the New York Times Book Review, Esquire, and the Paris Review, among many other places. He was selected by Colson Whitehead as one of the National Book Foundation's five under 35 honorees. He's the winner of the Penn Gene Stein Book Award and a finalist for the National Book Critics Circle John Lennon, John Lennon Award for Best First Book and the Aspen Words Literary Prize. So, George and Nana, the stage is yours. Thank you so much. And, you know, I'm super excited to be here today, George. As you can see, I've even worn this old world relic. I think it's called the Taiyi. <laughs> um, <laughs> no actual utility, I would not recommend it. But, you know, for the day I felt interested in trying. So uh, I had this little intro um, just so that the people know how I know um, this man we're all here to see today. So in George Saunders' story, Sea Oak, the characters live in a not great situation and are desperate to improve things. At the time I read it, I could associate with this deeply. I was living in a sea oak of sorts and it wasn't just that I could understand the story and knew the story understood me. It was that I could feel the author taking me and the story's journey seriously. Even while they were somehow a bright and dark humor that made the whole thing work. That story taught me something I've never forgotten. In the acknowledgments for my first book, I thank George for teaching me to laugh in the dark. One of many lessons of his I apply to both my work and my life. Also, that story contains one of my favorite passages in American letters, which I offer now with no further context. Show your cock, she said, and died again. <laughs> my senior year of college, it was announced that the George Saunders was visiting the university at Albany I attended. By then, I had applied to Syracuse because I discovered what an MFA was by Googling the name George Saunders. What I learned was it was an idea that seemed impossible. Three years to work on writing with legends, including my favorite writer, I applied. When Saunders visited, he did a brilliant reading and I sat in the crowd defeated. Defeated because somewhere over the course of his talk, he'd mentioned Syracuse and how only six out of 600 students were admitted. I took this as a personal sign from God, meaning don't beat yourself up when you get that rejection in a few months. You didn't have a chance. So when the Q&A portion of that event arrived, I gathered the remaining conviction I had and rose my hand. I decided that if I couldn't get an MFA, I would ask a question while I had Saunders there in front of me. I asked him, how he was able to have such rough stories without being cruel to his characters. Why didn't I feel like he was being cruel? He answered beautifully. I genuinely felt satisfied that even though I had no chance at the MFA, I had gotten word from Saunders himself and maybe that was enough. Somehow I got into the MFA. 
And around George, I was pretty much a spaz. I couldn't really talk to him for like almost the first year because even though he moves with a perpetual kindness and grace, it was all too much for me. I was lucky enough to take several courses with George and in those classes, I learned the most important tool a writer has is close reading, a tool we'll talk about much more this evening. I learned what it means to be a generous reader. I saw what it was to manage a class full of bright, sometimes psychotically ambitious young kids from Spring Valley, Rockin County by way of SUNY Albany who want to be so good at writing and makes them terrible at everything. George became my thesis advisor, reading for anyone else what would become my first book, Friday Black. He helped me figure out who I am as a writer. During our sessions, I would beg him without ever actually asking, should I be this kind of writer or that kind of writer? Surreal or realistic? Please, George, tell me what kind of writer I should be. George, in his infinite wisdom, when I tried to get him to tell me if I should be this or that, would always answer simply, yes. After one of our classes with George, the department had us write an evaluation as they always do. I remember writing, George's course was like church for writers. What I meant was each class session felt like we were partaking in the sacred, that we were discovering what it meant to be artists, that we were communing at the highest level in the name of the word. George has won all the, George has won all the awards. And if I listed them here today, this already too long intro would probably double in length, but I will tell you this, and it should be obvious because I would never go this hard for any white guy unless it was true. George Saunders is who they say he is. A living icon whose character and life far outweighs his extremely considerable artistic ability. He's the nicest guy in the room, too nice. He's the one who'll make you feel like, damn, I can probably be a better person. He's generous beyond belief. He's wise as hell, he's wise as hell, and he cares about the world and you. When I was having my obligatory art school breakdown, he told me, you are not your thoughts. And in some ways, that was literally life-saving truth I needed to hear. So I mentioned George a lot in writerly spaces because one, I'm proud as hell to know him, but also it makes people like me much, much more. I was literally in Africa once. And I was having a great time and I mentioned I knew, knew George and instantly I was seen as like 60% more impressive. And to be honest, I felt kind of weird. I was like, even here in Africa, white men wins again, but it's okay, it's, <laughs> it's George. <laughs> but seriously, and, um, and this is the last thing, I've been compared to George in like articles and whatnot. And somebody once asked me, does that ever get annoying being compared to him? And I had to look at them like, wow, uh, you don't really understand me at all because the truth is, it is the honor of a lifetime to be in any way compared to one of the greatest living writers on this planet, to one of the kindest humans I know, to a man that's been my teacher in life and art from long before I ever met him. It's an honor because all I could ever want to do for a reader is what George has done for me. Remind me, it's okay, even when it's not, and that I have the choice to laugh at all of it. So please, disembodied heads all across the interweb, I won't see you, but take this moment to give a big round of applause to my teacher, mentor, friend, the legend himself, the one and only, George Saunders. And this is where people are doing this. <laughs> hey. Could be going for another couple of seconds and now. <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much for that, Nana. Oh my God. I, I think we should just stop right now and I'll go upstairs and weep a while and then we could call it a night. <laughs> Thank you so much for that. It was lovely. No, um, it's, uh, <laughs> I'm very happy and excited, very genuinely to get a chance to do this. Um, it's an honor for me. And everything I said was really true. And, you know, I, the funny thing is that intro was one third of the length it was gonna be. So <laughs> I didn't wanna do the intro and then be like, now we have time for one more question. Uh, so yeah, I'm super excited to be here. <laughs> and um, I'm super excited to have this book, A Swimming in a Pond in the Rain out in the world. And uh, to start off, you know, I want it to be, I want this to be a relatively chill sort of hour we have, but also I don't wanna pretend we're in some neutral time where nothing is going on. So before we get into it proper, I guess my first question is, how are you doing? How's the, how's the family? 
how are you guys holding up? Well, thanks for asking. We're doing okay. We're just trying to be, you know, good citizens and stay home. And uh, I, I just feel like the sadness is starting to creep in a little bit now in this, you know, whatever, ninth, 10th month or whatever. But um, I, I kind of told myself early that it's, you know, the job is to stay home. If you can, you stay home. So trying to do that, and I guess just kind of trusting that whatever is going on, it'll, it'll, you know, get into me and get into the work and, and uh, get clean up in there. How, how are you doing? I'm hanging in there. I'm up and down. Uh, I think uh, right for the, it was a long time where I felt really disconnected to my own writing and reading in general, um, which is, uh, but that's sort of passed. And that's another reason why, and this is not an artful segue that I'm trying to make just the truth. Looks like yours that um, <laughs> sort of remind me why, uh, what it is to really be a close reader feels so important right now. So I'm excited. I've, I've turned a certain kind of corner with my own writing. I'm hardcore into this novel I'm working on and um, my families as well as I think can, you know, we're healthy enough. And so I'll take it. Yeah, yeah, that's it. It's, it's a funny, I had a funny time there where at the beginning I felt a little guilty for being productive, but then I thought, well, if it, you know, if, if turning to the thing that we love and being productive helps us weather this thing out in a better spirit then you should just you know say yes to it um, but it's a very surreal thing to be to know that there's a huge amount of suffering out there but somehow um you know it's very hard to actually get a feeling for it, it it's it's sort of statistical and uh so it's it's a deep crazy time you know and then then the capital gets overrun so you know it's a lot to deal with and yeah. I, I try to <laughs> yeah. as a way generous with all of it I think of you know someone told me this like the work that we're trying to do that's sort of maybe active generosity too because I know how much books have even though in the beginning it was very difficult to read how they've been a comfort in this time and um but getting into uh whether it's reading and teaching and the whole and all of it that we're trying to do um you've obviously been teaching for a long time now and this book for me it feels like a really necessary and natural step uh, I know you've written about story before, but to really detail the process of reading this way feels special. Um, I was wondering how much your life as a professor reinforced your writing life and sort of vice versa. And is there even a distinction anymore between teaching and writing? Yeah. You know, we were talking beforehand. I think you were actually in the last class that was actually the Russian class I taught for 20 years. I don't think I'll, I'll, I'll be able to teach it again. So that was... Uh, I, I think it's been really mutually reinforcing. You know, you um, uh, to, you know, imagine that for 20 years you get to go into a class with people like yourself, you know, and who who are freshly in love with fiction, and then you all get to take it seriously together. You know, it's it's the best. And um, so, something about the idea of of kind of saying, all right, we if two human beings huddle over a text, you know, and and look at it together. Uh, certainly they're bonded to the reader, but they're also kind of bonded to each other. So in those classes, you know, those moments when the teacher student distinction would vanish and we'd all be kind of trying to figure something out and somebody would yeah. shout something brilliant out, you know, those, those are um, really at this point in my life, I look back, I'm like, I don't really know that my work will last, you know, but, but I think those moments are, are uh, those are really to, you know, to be proud of, I think. Absolutely. And spoiler alert, uh, your work will last. <laughs> um, the, <laughs> that kind of connects to um, something, um, the, the question I have next, which is kind of like, a, I guess, my personal curiosity question. And I thought about it in several instances. I remember being at AWP after you had done the introduction and sort of the swarm that had gone around you and the excitement in the air. Uh, I basically just imagine there's a lot of pressure with being sort of like, George Saunders, the author in the last couple of years, uh, which basically means being one of the most widely respected artists in our field in the world. And I remember at QS, you did a really good job of sort of absorbing the weird energy people like me would sometimes bring into, bring into the class. And you sort of put that aside so that it was never about you per se and was always about the work. Um, how do you manage the way you are perceived artistically, like you as an individual and um, how does, uh, and how basically the way, the way the world sees you and how does that, if, does it in any way affect your work or your teaching? Yeah, I, I think the trick is, uh, you know, to, a book like this is a way of getting back in touch with the, the kind of the wellspring, you know, these, like these R Russians are so great. So for me over the years, the, the, the semester has always been a nice way of saying, okay, 
the world is saying nice things to you. But when you go read Tolstoy, you're kind of like, well, oh, okay, wait, no, that's kind of a little bit of smoke, you know? Yeah. So it, to, to go back to these great writers again and again is to kind of be recalibrated and go, well, it's, it's nice if, if you're doing well, that's nice, but let's not keep our eye over there. Let's keep it on the, on the you know, these, these great people. Uh, and then also, I think part of, you know, I don't know if you feel this, but I feel like part of the, the toolbox that a writer has, one of the tools is, is sort of um, a constant self-doubt, you know, feeling like even if the world is liking something it, you do, you don't quite believe it. You know, you've got something in you. I've got something in me that wants to do good things uh, and is really willing to work hard to, um, to do it, partly I guess out of self-doubt maybe, you know, so it, I kind of, I guess I kind of rely on self-doubt, you know, you, you, if, um, yeah. And also, you know, I think we talked about this before the, the end game for any writer is a long productive career where you get to burn through your stuff and, and get to the big questions that are vital for you to do that. You have to do a lot of things along the way. And one of them, I think is to get a, a handle on praise and blame and all that, and just sort of um, find a way to soldier through it, you know, and, and uh, yes, and I've watched, you know, that that was amazing when Friday, Black, uh, when Black Friday Black came out, it was amazing to watch you deal with that. And you were so gracious all the time. And I saw you with our students, you know, who were, who had been just, your just colleagues. A just bit, a few years but um, I think it's, oh, sorry. Uh, while you're getting reconnected, I, I think it's um super encouraging for us to hear that self-doubt is um, a battery for you. Because I think one thing writers are extremely, extremely good at, all of them. And, you know, I think that's an important thing for us to be able to weaponize. Sorry, I don't, I think um, self-doubt is an important thing for us to be able to weaponize. And I'm really great, grateful that you said that because I think uh, a lot of people will, get something from that. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, you know, when we're rewriting, I think that's so much part of it is to say, uh, okay, I wrote this yesterday. I liked it yesterday. Um, in a sense to say, is there anybody who might not like it, or is there any part of this that I could do better? Uh, I think that's something that really distinguishes the, the writers who, who do big things uh, is that they're able to imagine a version beyond the one that's in front of them. And I think it's reasonable that you, you know, your, your self doubt could be a, a, a driver for that. And on the other hand, you know, you certainly see people who are so self confident that they don't have that kind of hunger to go back and revise, you know. So, one of the things I, I find myself talking about at Syracuse now is just that there, you know, you people only have tendencies. You know, a person might be ambitious or might be uh, whatever. You can't really change that. You, you know, you are what you are, but, but you can, on the page, you can convert that possibly negative energy into a positive one. So I think self-doubt is one, is one of those things, you know, self-doubt is, is another way of saying rigor, you know, or dedication. I'm a, I, I have a, a rigor dedicate, um, dedication question I was going to say for later. And, um, it's, a uh, it's about like, um, I don't know if you know, but a lot of people that know you have like George stories, like George Saunders stories. It's almost like Kobe Bryant who I loved, rest in peace, Kobe Bryant. But, um, and so the George Saunders story I tell is this, and I don't know if you would remember it, but uh, this was my third year. It was like a workshop follow-up and you had just met with Keen, I wanna say. Uh, and he had asked you like, how are you doing? And you were like, you know, I'm really hammering into that ghost book, which is Lincoln and the Bardo. And you were like, well, I'm basically in it like 18 hours a day. And I remember hearing that and being like super shook, like, oh my God. <laughs> and um and I followed up doing my meeting and you were like I was like did you just say like when you're not teaching pretty much all day you're like going through the book and you were like yeah and so um for me what I what that makes me think of and the reason I tell that story is I think when a lot of when people call someone geniuses or when people use that term I think it can be a reduction in some ways I think it forgets that a lot of what people are perceive or what they're alluding to is really mind from the self and so um, in some ways, my question is like, where did you get your like, I don't know, black mamba spirit, but really it's like, where'd you get that drive, sort of that desire to like kind of go that crazy with yourself? Cause I don't know if everyone really gets that about you despite everything else. I'm interested in like that part. Yeah, I, I don't know really. I mean, I wasn't a good student or a hard worker really at school, but I think um, 
the way I always think of it is I, I had from the time I was really young, a, a love for the world. I felt very much, very fond of it, you know, and very interested in it. And um, also had a feeling that I sort of wasn't good enough for it. Like I, I, I didn't feel um, that I had enough to offer personally, even as a little kid, I remember that feeling. If I liked something, I always felt a little bit, oh, I wish I was more, you know? So th that's obviously not the best, you know, like uh, psychological arrangement. But what I found was if that somehow I thought, well, if I can do something, if I can uh, do something big, uh, then then somehow that'll equalize it a little bit, you know? And so that was the initial motivation. And then um, over the years, it became sort of just uh, really, I'll say pleasurable to work. I don't know if it's, you know, it's not, it's not without, it's a mixed blessing, but like that 18 hours, I was having such a good time. Uh, so somehow the early desire to kind of find a place in the world led me to this area where I found out I could actually improve things. I could actually make a world seem real and all that kind of stuff that, you know, that I know you know about. Uh, and that became so much fun that now it's, it's more or less just, um, the drive is, is to have a good time, you know, and, and, uh, I really have a great time doing it. So I don't know. I, I, again, I think it's a case where if I look back at the 20 year old, I was who wanted so much, you know, from the world and didn't know how to get it, uh, and relied on a kind of obsessiveness to get there. That isn't that great. But over time, I think that thing can kind of convert a little bit and then you go, well, you know, maybe it's all right. Yeah. And that's interesting again, because it's, it feels like you were, able, you've been able to shift some of the parts of yourself that in both cases, whether it be with self doubt and obsession, that kind of can have a negative dark energy and bring them over into this place where they really serve you powerfully and purposefully. And um, that feels like a very powerful kind of shift. Yeah, and it's so interesting with teaching because that's really at Syracuse, you know, when you came, I think it was, we got 650 applications for six spots. So people show up and they're, they're just amazing already then what you get to do is try to say, okay, this person has this tendency, which right now she's misunderstanding as a negative tendency, and she's trying to eradicate it. Uh, maybe the answer is to actually bless it and say, no, actually, that's, if you're, if you are so strongly inclined to, to write this kind of story, maybe you should give into it. And then let's talk technically about how you can make that work. So it is in some ways, it's, it's um, about pre being presented with somebody wildly talented who has a certain energy that they might misunderstand as negative, um, but through revising and through kind of just I'm just touching the places that are really good and re and affirming that a, a person can sometimes see uh, that complicated packages a package of gifts a little a little more generously I guess for themselves. It's um it's really interesting to hear you talk about it because um I feel like while I was there and I'm super grateful for both you and Dennis Biota for this I was almost like. I felt like there was a period where I would bring things into workshop and I was almost like daring the world to make me stop it. I think uh, <laughs> I about the story with the, <laughs> the fetus. It was almost like, I was like, this feels really ridiculous. How ridiculous can I be? And hopefully someone will tell me to stop, even though I knew like I liked it. And I was mm. almost like kind of getting someone like, this, this is pretty ridiculous, isn't it, huh? And I'm super grateful for how mm -hmm. all of you guys, but in my mind, particularly you and Dana, I had Dana first year. Um, really didn't shut it down, you know? No, and it was so, you know, for for me, it, I remember in that third year, I think you brought the Finkelstein five story in early in the year, you know? And I just thought, wow, that'll be fun to watch the workshop because in those cases, you hope that people will, will just respond 99% positively and affirm what's been done. And as, as I remember, they kind of did. It was really, um, it's one of the best kind of things when someone brings in something that's really got... Uh, a person behind it and the class just kind of goes yeah yeah keep doing that you know so it, it's really interesting and and um you know to year after year you present with people who are so talented and you know over the 20 years they've been talented in different ways and they've had different uh archetypes and different role models but it's always such a joyous thing you know to see a young person who um uh suddenly goes oh yeah i i can do this you know i know how to do it and and it's not like they're totally transforming themselves or lopping anything off. It's quite the opposite. They're, they're leaning into who they've been all along. And that's, that's really, really cool. Yeah, it's super cool because there's a certain amount of shame. <laughs> or I felt a certain amount of shame about like, I know what I'm 
learning quickly is being considered literary for, for the most part. And in some ways, as, which is ironic because obviously you were right there, but in some ways I felt like it wasn't what I was doing. And um, it, mm -hmm. it's, uh, it was nice to have those kind, of, those kind of moments of affirmation. And it's also interesting that you say that one of the biggest challenges in, for me is workshopping a really, 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 really good story. You know, um, when you have yeah. workshop and having a great yeah. story. So I mean, just I'm glad you said that because uh, I I'm also you know th there's a lot there's a lot that goes a lot of art in doing that. I wonder if you could talk a little bit about about that and like just managing a workshop. Yeah, I I think it's the hardest thing because it, on the teacher's part you have to have the confidence to just say yeah that's good. You know, there there was yeah. a story that I used to hear about. Carver when he was teaching at Syracuse I don't know if this is true or not but it's a great story so I hope it is but he would he was teaching kind of a forms class like this Russian class but in the American short story so he'd come in having assigned something by you know whoever um, and the class would talk about it and he just sort of very sagely sit back and listen you know and then at the end all eyes would turn to him you know like well you know what do we need to know and supposedly he sometimes would just go yeah Wow. That's a, that's really good. <laughs> See you next week, you know, <laughs> but that, but it's hard because, you know, especially like, like for me as a working class person, if I'm in front of the class, I feel like my job is to critique and say something and, you know, be kind of uh, present. But when a good story comes in, uh, you know, it, it really is a, an amazing act of discipline to just go, yeah, that's you got it. That's, you know, and then sometimes in the follow-up call, I'll, I'll do an hour long follow-up call after the workshop. You can really impress upon the person and, and talk about like, okay, when you were writing this, how did it feel to you? You know, uh, that's a really useful conversation because sometimes mm. uh, it, it can tell you something about your, your body dynamic in a moment of high creativity, uh, which is really worth, worth seeing because in a sense, I think you're kind of steering toward that. You know, you're steering to feel a certain way so that the words on the page are uh, a, a certain way. So yeah, that, that's really hard. It's not hard to cut something up, but to, to praise is hard. Yeah. And the confidence piece is, is really significant because for better or worse, like, you know, people in MFA, people in artists are very sensitive and also very aware. They're trying to see where they stand, I think too much, you know, a, a lot, all of us. And yeah, yeah. You have to like not let the sort of external pressure keep you from saying the truth about that particular story. And still honor it in the, in the ways you would uh, critique, I guess, you know? So. Yeah. 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 I love yeah. that. It's really, it's really interesting. You know, I've always, I, I've had kind of a, um, you know, while people are in the program, I really keep a little distance. I don't really want to be buddies with anybody or, or, or socialize. And so that allows you that little bit of, um, you know, I, I, I don't want to make too much of it, but there are times where you can see that somebody needs either their bubble you know, inflated or deinflated a little bit. And yeah. if you don't have that, you know, close personal thing, you can do it without even, you pretend you don't even know you just did it, you know? Yeah. Um, like, I, I remember from being in workshop, one of the most useful things is when somebody brings thing in and you're just a little indifferent to it, you know, you're just, yeah, it's fine. And it they used to kill me when I would bring something in and, and nobody reacted, you know? So it's, it's a pretty interesting job. Um, and as I get older, it becomes more interesting because I think when you're younger, you can't help but be a little competitive or a little bit, um, you, you kind of want to assert that you know something that the class doesn't, but with time and with age, you're, it's so, um, uh, it, it, you become fond of the activity and fond of the people and you become so hopeful that they'll, they'll find what they're looking for in art, you know, and it's not a guarantee and you can't, and, and it's not also necessarily publication even, but people oh. come to us with these, these hopes, you know, you, you, you just really feel that you hope they'll get what they need from you, you know, and then I'm trying to become a better listener because you don't always hear the first time what somebody needs from you. You know, if, you, if you're trying too hard to give it to them, you might not hear what they actually are asking for. Wow. Um, I love that. I hope people are like, right. If you teach workshop, this is good to like take notes on this, but um, <laughs> so early in this book mm -hmm. though, you highlight the um, one page exercise in which you read a story one page at a time and sort of reflect on the experience. And it's uh, one of many kind of creative approaches to reading that I think really helped me grow as a close reader. I remember doing that exercise in, in that class with, I want to say that same story, you do it in the book, in the car, the checkoff story. And 
it grew my awareness of like a sort of dance of choices and questions and expectations that the reader and writer are always doing together. So um, um, how did, for you, how did you really develop as a teacher? I'm interested because I've stolen a lot of cool lessons from you and I'm just sort of wondering how they came to you in the first place. I think a lot of it was sort of just improv, you know, like um, when I was younger, I would kind of not think about teaching until a day before, you know, kind of like, ah. but also I was, I, I, here's the thing at Syracuse that I think is that we do that's really smart. We all kind of um, agree that first we have to be good writers to be good teachers. So it's kind of assumed that you're going to be off really working on your stuff. And then the teaching will come and will be taken very seriously, but it's a mix, you know, you, it's not. So I would often be working on some story that I was really, you know, loving being inside of and working, working, working. And Tuesday would come along and um, I would just think, okay, what do I need to do? And in that mode, it, it, there's a kind of urgency, like, okay, well, really, what would be the least bullshitty thing I could do tomorrow, you know, um, to, 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 to teach. And one of the things I always noticed was it's, it's a, it's a, such a buzzkill when you start talking about a story and somebody becomes very academic about it, you know, you're talking about a story and someone says, well, I think the, the patriarchal aspects are, you know, th that's probably true from a critical point of view, but for, for a writer, it, it's sort of like, uh, if I say, make your story less patriarchal or more, you know, whatever, it's hard to work with. So I just thought, I think I used to do it with a Hemingway story. Uh, I just thought, let's just go back to basics and see what's really happening inside our heads when we read. That should help us as writers, you know? So I, I started doing that and it was, it's always fun. You know, it's always a fun thing to see that actually most people in the room are in the same place at the end of a page. Um, mm -hmm. So I think for a writer, it's, a, it's kind of a, a nice way of just saying, okay, let's just forget all the, that we think we know and ask why do we keep reading you know, on a sentence to sentence. There, there was another exercise. I don't know if we did it in there, but I used to just take five paragraphs from a, a literary journal, the first paragraph of five stories in a journal, cross out the author's name and then pass them out. And I would say, okay, rank these. And then I would be the room or else I just would kind of, you know, sit back. And I never said on what basis, it's just, just rank them. And of course, you know, the, the students there are so great that they would just instantly leap into it and start ranking. And at the end, you put it on a board and see, you know, and you start talking about where did you decide that you hate this story, you know, mm. or when did you, when did you feel pulled in? And, you know, you can always put it at a certain line. There's some line where the story goes off the, off the grid or, or one line where you go, okay, I'm reading this to the end. Uh, so that's a kind of a you know a fun one. Oh, and I'm also gonna I'm gonna write it down in a second because <laughs> that sounds <laughs> incredible. Um, and thinking about uh, when people get disconnected and sort of maybe rotate a story and also just line by line, one of the things you taught me was sort of line level attention can solve almost any kind of moral ethical problem in the story. Can you uh, maybe talk about? your thoughts on like, I guess, ethically sound work or like work that basically isn't afraid to go difficult places for the sake of the story? Sure, sure. I mean, one of the things, you know, as a workshop instructor that is really hard to deal with is when somebody brings in a story that actually is sexist or racist or uh, homophobic or something or, or somehow, you know, has a bias in it. And it's, um, it's difficult just because, but then invariably somebody will point it out which is good, but then the discussion is over because the person gets defensive and it becomes a, um, you know, a, a, a much bigger and more hurtful conversation than, than you usually want. So it seems to me that you, it, whenever someone says this story is, let's say sexist, the move is to say, sure, show me where. And on this principle that we're talking about story, you know, you're reading it, the first three sentences, you're, that thought that it's sexist isn't in your mind, suddenly line four, it is, okay you can scientifically observe that, you know, it, it happens for a reason. So if the comment is, um, and then usually there's some other, um, you know, I tell the story in the book, it, I think it happened in the class that, that you were in, but uh, somebody pointed out that this one Google story is sexist, and it is. It's also really interesting for a lot of other reasons, but it's definitely sexist. So mm -hmm. I said, where? And this student was really a good student, and she pointed out exactly where, and we were able to deduce that when she said sexist, what she meant was in two parallel uh, narrative moments, the author let the, uh, a male character have a, a full bodied internal monologue 
And when the same thing happened to the woman, he made fun of her. And actually this happened, I think twice in the story. So that's proof. That's proof of exactly where the story went off. Um, to me, that's really powerful. You know, I mean, it's one thing to be able to say that's a sexist story. That's important. But to be able to say exactly where, um, I think for the person who's making the observation, it's a, it's a, it's a powerful thing. So since the story is a linear temporal phenomenon, whatever you say about it, it started at a certain place. You know, even if you're saying this is a brilliant, lovely story, you maybe didn't think that until line 12 and then the feeling started to grow. So I think it's to, it's to our benefit as people and, and writers to be able to be precise about where these feelings that we have start. You know? it's, it's again, a really, really powerful sort of move to make. And I remember on my, um, on my on my manuscript for, I think what it was called How to Sell a Jacket then, but Friday Black, um, one of the main takeaways was like, mm -hmm. be simple, be precise. And I made that like my, I took a picture of something and I made it my phone background for a while. But it makes me think of um, <laughs> that idea of, of, of precision and how the thing that's very overwhelming about the prospect of kind of writing anything is also a power that you can rest in. So what I mean by that is, the overwhelming responsibility mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that every single thing you have the power over. And it's just this linear space where you can control all of it. And uh, how to manage that, I don't know, pressure, but also power and thinking about the just grand responsibility. And like in the beginning, it, sometimes it feels a little scary. Like, wow, I, I, this feels like it will crush me. But also then realizing this actually means I'm, Mm. Not all powerful, but I have a lot of power. Yes, yes, beautifully said. That's exactly right. And I think too, then the one thing I always try to remind myself is just titrate in a little bit of fun because it's when we say control, I, I don't think we really like when I publish a story, I don't know every every single thing that someone's going to feel about it, you know. But but I but I feel I've read it enough times that I'm blessing it just as it is, and I've I can pretty much honestly say I've I've. I've looked under every rock, you know, pretty much at least once. Um, and that's all a way of saying we've taken the time to inject ourselves into it by micro choosing over and over and over again. Now that for somebody like me, that can be a terrible Rubik's cube OCD nightmare, unless you titrate in the idea that it's for fun. Also that a reader will catch most of that. It, they won't catch all of it. So um, yeah, yeah. And that's a bit, that's exactly right. And it, it is sort of a, you know, uh, maybe the one place in our life where we can exert positive control. Um, and in the process, this is something I'm not sure about, but I have felt this way. Tell me if you feel this way, that by doing this, you a better version of yourself ends up on the page than is walking sure. around in the world. You know, uh, I can't yeah. think yet. Yeah, I can't think fast enough to, to be a decent person, but I can write slow enough to be a decent person. Revision um, allows me my like higher self, the highest self I have in me to like exist in a physical space, I think. And it doesn't usually exist in a physical space. Yeah. In real life, some of these things that right. these people do, I'm like, <laughs> pretty quickly, I'm like, probably violence is the answer. <laughs> and, and then, cause like, but I think when I, yeah. <laughs> yeah. in my revision, sometimes I'm like, that's still the answer, but also no, in my revision, I'm able to sort of get to a place of, constantly growing sort of this human capacity and um it's a i think it's a really i do think that and i usually think of it the uh, one direction and i like how you brought it back to the other way like i usually think my work has its higher self but i, I should remember that also some of that comes back into me and my person or i i i hope so um yeah in the book yeah yeah, yeah. Hmm. no good um so yeah in the in the book you write, this is really early on, uh, and I'm gonna jump right into the paragraph where you're like, uh, this is resistance literature written by progressive reformers in a repressive culture under constant threat of censorship. In a time when writers politics could lead to exile, imprisonment and execution uh, or an execution. So, um, and I, in a, just a minute, I'm gonna jump to um, audience questions, but for you, um, and I'll have maybe one more question after this, um, you know, we're also in a pretty intense political time to say the least. And I'm interested in what you think the role of the writer is today and how, you know, the oppressive and also the oppressive powers that are around us today. Yeah, yeah, that's, uh, I, I think here's what I, I'm thinking just this last week is like, 
you know, if we, if we wonder whether storytelling is essential or is it just this kind of niche thing that, you know, you would have MFA programs. When you look at those crowds in the, in the Capitol, you know, uh, you see what the result of shitty storytelling is. Right. It, it, some really, really false narratives went out in a really brittle, un, unresponsive medium, landed on some people who weren't actually very good at parsing truth from lies. And they were guilty essentially of, um, you know, bad, uh, uh, inefficient projection or, or unrefined projection. That, that's the opposite of what we, what we learn in, in fiction. In fiction, we, we learn that we have initial projection in a first draft. And then we refine it. And that teaches us that those first projections are not the word of God. You know, they're just what came to mind. And through mm. a practice of specificity and repetition, we can actually learn. I don't know. We may not be learning that much about the world, but we're learning about our habits of mind, you know. So I'm not really, you know, I, I don't, I, I'm not particularly rosy about, I, I think what we do is something like what a good cook does, you know or a, a beautiful dancer, or, or we just, fiction can mitigate a little bit. It can make the world a little bit better. Um, but I don't have any big illusions about its, its grand thing. But if you want to see what the world looks like without good storytelling, you, you can look at the Capitol and, and you can see how powerful bad storytelling can be in, in, in people's minds, I think. That's, I what think, is your answer to that question? I want to hear it. Um, it's hard. And people ask me a lot, and I even hesitated to ask you because it feels it stuff I say that okay that I think is real but sometimes if I say it too much and I'm feeling down about the world it feels more false like I'll say like write truth to power speak truth to power for example and I do believe mm -hmm. like, I think shining a light on what's real what is important for me like if I get mushy enough I'll basically like rem basically come down to like reminding people that love is a thing and is sort of like a uh, connected humanity that should never be denied. But also um, sometimes it's uh, just to uh, give, a, create a, not a safe space, but a space for someone, create a space. Sometimes it's like space mm -hmm, maybe. Mm -hmm. and, uh, yeah. and for me, like in reading this book, and I'm gonna make sure I talk about this book because I feel like, have I not mentioned enough? Um, it's, it makes it brings me back to that classroom space space which i haven't got to be in, a, in that context in a while which is the place where not that i thrive but i feel like i could thrive and in this moment that feels important to me so that mm -hmm. space is afforded feels like really powerful and essential um so that's one thing for me i think the the truth to power thing is big and like uh sometimes planting seeds that manifest in something else later on down the line is really key so um but I also think for everybody it might be something different. I think that's okay. You know, I don't, uh, yeah. I also try to resist like, you know, I don't think just writing is like everything, but I know it's, I do think it's a thing for sure. And it does feel yeah. particularly yeah. counterweighted against uh, these other people who have been mobilized by, I like how you said it, shitty storytelling. So yeah, yeah. I love um, I, I'm gonna, I have more, I'm gonna, I gotta let these people ask questions because it's, <laughs> I, I know how it feels to want to ask a George on this question and not get it in. So uh, maybe I'll just go down them now. Yeah, I'll go, I'll try to get some in. Um, so this is a question. So this book, if people didn't, if people missed it, it focuses specifically on uh, four Russian authors. And so someone asked, what was missing in American stories that you found in the Russian stories? Yeah, that's a great question. You know, I, I don't really know, but I'll tell you the way it, it happened was I taught this class when I first started teaching and it was so much fun. And it was just like, um, I felt that the stories were suited to my teaching style. And then the next year I tried to teach a class in the American short story and it was okay. It was all right. But I found myself um, not having as much confidence about the American stories. And I don't really know. It must just be that I'm kind of, my, my interest in fiction is kind of didactic. It's kind of moral ethical. I really do think, I mean, when I was young in Chicago, I, I was attracted to writing that gave me some idea of how I should be living, you know, uh, and the Russians are, are open to that. So really it was just over the years, this class was always fun. It was always, um, it always brought me closer to the students. Uh, it always, and whenever I would teach this class, I'd get a little burst in my own writing, you know, so 
So uh, I haven't quite figured that the answer to that out quite yet, but it has something to do with the moral, you know, the moral prerogative. I remember it being kind of like the signature class and everyone's like, George, doing the Russians class again. And it was a yeah. whole yeah, I love it. kind of deal. Um, yeah, I'm going to ask some questions that overlap with what I was going to ask anyways, which is that ethically okay? It's okay. Um, someone said, Professor Saunders, can you talk about your teachers? I had that question as well. Um, how do they influence how you taught? When slash how did you give up your voice as a teacher? And congratulations on the new book. Thanks. The, the first part was to talk about my teachers. Is that right? Yeah. How did you like sort of how did you develop your teaching style and who were your teach who were like the teachers that developed you as a teacher? Sure. Well, you know, when I was in high school, I had a, a teacher whose name was Sherry Williams at that point. She's now Sherry Lindblom. And she was a young uh, English teacher and she just loved writing. And she had such a great sense of humor. And she kind of, you know, we were all a bunch of South Side lunkheads who didn't really want, we had to be in that class and we didn't. And she just made it seem so beautiful. Like um, I remember her showing one time a, one of those old fashioned film strips and there was a picture of Nathaniel Hawthorne standing there, you know? And she just said, there was a guy who was really alive in his own time. There was a guy who looked around the world while he was here and tried to make sense of it. And I thought that was so great. So she was a big influence, just trying to, you know, get on her radar. And then years later, uh, Tobias Wolf and Douglas Unger at Syracuse. And the thing I, I took from them most was that they took us seriously. They really, um, they didn't pander to us, uh, but they didn't overlook us. And mm. for me to see uh, the way that they lived was really important. I'd never met really a, a, a published writer before. So to see that Toby... Uh, always carved out a lot of time for his family. And he, he, he always spoke of them with so much love. And uh, so it was, I think for me at that point, it was just watching the way that someone could be a really good person. And Doug was always so kind and took so much time with us. And then you'd read their work and you're like, okay, so they're, they are intensely crazy artists for four hours a day. And the rest of the day, they're really nice people. And they, or, you know, they're, they're, they're good people. I think before that, I had the idea that you had to be a barbarian, you know, to be a great writer, you had to be out of control and, and everything. And so it was more like, I mean, at that point, more life lessons, I think, than anything else. And that's, a, that's another good point, which I'm, another thing I'm grateful for, uh, having people like you as an example, who are like, kind of just cool people. It reminds you, you don't have to be mm. like a jerk or like, so like, mm -hmm. with your work that you can't see the world right in front of you. Um, so I appreciate mm -hmm. Um, someone asked a question, which maybe I think you could identify with. Um, do you have any advice for someone? I'm not going in the order that they hear it. I'm just like jumping around. Do you have any advice for someone who works a sometimes soul-sucking day job that and has to fit writing in when they can? <laughs> yeah, that was that was me for sure. I, I I think you have to say. I mean, if you can't, you know, if that's if that's what you have to do, and many people, of course, do. Uh, I think you just have to say, I'm a writer no matter what I'm doing. You know, if, if a day is too much for me and I can't write, I'm still a writer. Um, second of all, I think you can say, even if my life is kind of crappy, it's a life. And if there's, you know, if there's two, one or more people present, it's automatically literature. So if you're at the, the soul sucking job, the soul sucking job might be your first book. I mean, I, I wonder not if you knew, you know, when you were, when you were working in retail, if that would be. Uh, you know, a, a really important part of your, of your first book. So I think that to have that the discipline to say, well, I happen to have landed in this life. Let's just assume that it's literature, you know? And then the third thing, which is a little more practical is I think it's uh, some of us, I certainly have had it, have this idea that unless you get a six hour block, it doesn't count. But I think you can sort of give yourself a pass and say, you know, it's possible to do, a, if you do a good half an hour a day, that might give you half a page or something. Well, that's pretty good. You know, you, I think you can sort of force yourself to make it work under those circumstances. You know, it, it's a challenge. And I think that's, I see that so much when people leave our program, that's what they go back into is how, do, how in the world do I come home after a full day and work up the energy? And I just, I sympathize and it's, it's just part of the game at this point. Yeah. Um, that's uh, important for, I think, a lot of people to hear you know, that even 30 minutes can be something uh, powerful and you could do something with that amount of time. Yeah. Um, I saw a question that it just got bumped up. Um, da, 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 da. I wanted to get to it. Um, your work, even when it's most hilarious and bizarre, often feels spiritual. Do you deliberately try to weave 
these transcendent elements in your fiction or do they just sort of organically emerge and then not they, they just sort of they just sort of emerge yeah i mean i think i because i understand that that's what a story is supposed to do is is i i always picture it like um almost like a um a date or not a date i don't know i've had a date in a long time but but um maybe like a uh any kind of social thing you, you you go into it with a certain expectation and that expectation is confined by your ability to imagine okay then at some point if you're lucky uh the thing explodes into something bigger you know the river overflows its banks so i think it's i always when i start a story i always know that the first part is kind of yeah this is kind of just regular hmm we can't have that because this, the river is not supposed to flow along within the banks it's supposed to overflow so for me, the way to, to get the overflow to happen is to say, okay, what's wrong with a mundane little story that that's just simple and real? Well, it leaves out a whole bunch of stuff like death, for example, you know, it leaves out the crazy shit, uh, uh, the, the crazy fact that we were here and then we are, and then we're not all, all that stuff. So, so to get the river to overflow its banks, I think that's what we, when you say transcendent or spiritual, that's kind of what I'm trying to do is say, even though this story is about Wednesday, you know, in, in Albany, New York, uh, it's got to be about the whole shebang or else the reader's going to be a little disappointed. So you might think of style or form as a way of trying to get the river to overflow its banks. And, you know, like in, in this year, you know, we've all become aware of so many sad things and so many deep, cruel undertones to life. Um, when we go back to normal, we're going to want to remember that that stuff is true. It's not like it gets less true. It's, it's still there. The wolf was still outside the door. And I think a story can kind of say, even though things seem this way right now, I'm not going to forget all the lessons I've learned in my whole life about the complexity of this. So your formal challenge is to find a way to make the story both seem to be happening and also get all the, the craziness of the world in there, or at least some of it. Yeah, that... While you were answering that, like my brain was kind of going to this place of really, it brought me to like idea of mindfulness and also just how much this is it, this moment that you're feeling, that's life, you know, that is. So yeah. we have the power, sometimes a, a story is is arriving at that place where we're not, sometimes not that like all around us is that ability to transcend or appreciate, I don't know, the fact that we're always participating in the whole thing and um yeah uh, that's right that's that's good to think about i'm like this is good i feel like i'm in class right now yeah. <laughs> um while writing a story me too <laughs> how do you reconcile um your temptation to assert control with allowing the story to be an exploration and surprise you as it unfolds from nicholas that's a great, that's a million dollar question. And I, in a way, the most honest answer would be go, yeah, exactly. That's right. That's, that is it. I, I think, you know, I think one thing we, we have to, re, you know, like in this kind of talk, like maybe with, with this kind of book, you, 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 the temptation to just give one answer. But I think, uh, think about this parable, the, the, the Buddha had a student who was a guitar player or something like a guitar player. And um, he asked Buddha, you know, when I meditate, should I be really like focused and tight or should it be a relaxing experience? And Buddha supposedly said, well, when you tune your guitar, do you make it too tight or too loose? And he said, well, you just do it correctly. Said, yeah, of course. So I think with these things, we know that there's one temptation, which is to over control the story. And as we talked earlier, be responsible for it. That's the job. But we also know that if we do that, we're going to get a reductive piece of shit. The reader sees coming from a mile away. So we can't do that too much, you know? So I say really that, and this is maybe the, you know, the, the, the bitter lesson is for each one of us, it's, I think we have to find which dial is essential to us and then really work on that. Like, okay, uh, like I have days when I'm going, you are being way too tight. You're controlling this too much and you're taking the fun out of it. Okay, then I have to not do that. The other days when it's being so fun that it's all over the place. So I think, you know, all these questions, ultimately they come back to the individual but I think the, the, the wisdom of that question is that that's what you'll spend your life trying to figure out. You know, that's, that's fair game. That's the whole game. Like with endings, when do you know you're done? Yeah. And like people say, when do you know you're done with an ending? Exactly. When, when do you know, <laughs> you know, you're done with your ending? Uh. <laughs> um, 
Tanya says, hi, George. How often do you have ideas you think would make a good story? How often do you have ideas you feel very strongly about but can't manage to turn them into anything you consider good? Mm, that's another good one. I, I, Doug Unger said one time, uh, if, if a young writer could tell the difference between a story he thought he should write and the story he really should write, he'd save himself about 12 years, you know? I think that's for me, for me now, the trick is to kind of, um, there's a certain quality. Like I, I, again, it's hard to describe, but if an idea comes to me, I can sometimes tell that it's slightly overdetermined and, and I just run away from it because I can't, I, one thing I can't do is I can't un overdetermine an idea once I've had it, once I've had it and it's, it's too tidy, I can't mess it up again. So I'll tend to just, Sometimes it's not even an idea. It's just a voice, you know, or a little, maybe a small concept, you know, like a little, oh, what if we had a, the Virgin Mary theme park or something? It, and then the thing that I'm looking for is just a little particular flavor of excitement with that, where like, yeah, a, a lot of voice could come from that. You know, a lot of situations could come from that. And the biggest thing I think is a feeling of like happiness, but also confidence. Like, yeah, hmm, I, I could, like, like when, you know, when I read your book, Donna, or when you were bringing those stories in individually, you, you could just feel that those stories had big shoulders. They could go anywhere. You know, you, you weren't really, uh, apart from what you said earlier, you weren't really asking for permission. The, that, those stories were, you know, they were, they were coming from you so genuinely. And I think that feeling is kind of what you're, what you're looking for, you know, like an yeah. overflow of, of something authentic, you know. By the time the third year came, I was like, well, I have to do a thesis. So something has to, you know, and, but my first year, I was really mm -hmm. going back and forth. And I think I even tried to submit that. Yeah. I'm realizing this like mid this session, like maybe that's what I was doing mentally with in Dana's workshop. Like, this is the wildest shit I have. So maybe this will mm -hmm. make prove I can't do this. And um, by the time I got to you, um, the third year, I was already like, well, for better or worse, this is who I am. And um, it's obviously yeah, yeah, yeah. back and forth, but I figured that out. Well, I think that was one of the really powerful things about, about that book was that, you know, the question that you were, you said you were asking yourself, should I be real or experimental? You did answer it. Yes. And because there were stories in there that were so crazy and wild, and there's some that were so beautifully human scaled, the reader goes, okay, so this person, Nana is both of those things. And I have to expand my vision to say, this is the human being who's there. And that, I think that's really, um, really powerful to, to answer that question. Yes means you're not, you know, you're not just doing that small theme, but excluding part of your range because it doesn't fit with the others. You're saying, let me find out what my range is by letting everything in. So that's. That's, I appreciate you saying that. Um, uh, let me try to get one of these uh, uh, high schooler. They just said, uh, do you have any advice for a high schooler who's an expire, aspiring writer, Phoebe? I definitely have been Phoebe and that would be what I was asking generally. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, well, I mean, kind of, I guess the obvious thing, which is read a lot, because I think there's some, sometimes I think in our culture now, there's a tendency for people to want to be writers, but maybe not so much want to be in the lineage of writers. So I think, you know, read, f find your lineage, you know, find the writers who maybe for reasons you can't even explain, you're hungry to read, you know, though somehow mysteriously, those people are part of your, they're your people, you know, um, and then I would say too, you know, I mean, it's, again, this is so corny, but I think live, you know, go out and, and actually work stuff that work in fields that aren't writing and find out what America, America is like, because, you know, you think, we all think we know what America is like. Uh, I mean, if the last few years have proved anything is that we did, we don't know. And any one of us knows it only partially. So I would say part of our responsibility is to go out and live and go talk to people that you think you don't like and uh, go in situations that maybe you know, you, you would dismiss um, and have your view expanded in that way. And then when you, when you turn to the questions of form and style, you'll have something to subjugate it to. I, I noticed this in, in our program. Sometimes people would come in with maybe not a strong view of the world yet. You know, they, they're young. They have a strong view of writing, but not a strong view of the world. If somebody comes in equally talented who has a strong view of the world, maybe because they've been out in it and they've taken a few knocks, you know, um, that person has something, uh, has a stronger investment in the questions of form and style. They're more, it's more urgent uh, for somebody like Nana, like you, for, to, to have come in and say, okay, 
abstract reasons. I have something urgent I want to say. Let me burn through some styles to figure out which one is the is the best. That, that's not an empty gesture. That's an that's an urgent gesture. So I think to live uh, in that you know that old Russian way, like what's this all about? You know, let me go out into my culture and don't prematurely love it or prematurely hate it. But first, let's see what it is. Then the burning knowledge that you have from that you're going to try to find artistic forms in which to position it. And that's great. You know? Wow. That is a good answer. <laughs> that's a good answer. To that. <laughs> and, and for God's sake, go to prom, go to prom. That's the other thing, please go to prom. Oh man. Um, still, I mean, if you don't mind, I'll ask a couple more questions. Uh, and if you have any, like, I don't know. Oh, I'm have um, let's see. Um, this is from Naomi. Uh, do you think it's true that mistakes can be great teachers? What's your favorite mistake from your career as a writer? I think mistakes can be great teachers. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, my, my mistake the, for me was that I had uh, very little, you know, came from a kind of a working class background, hadn't read that much, had sort of low confidence. And I uh, wanted to be Hemingway or Kerouac or somebody else. And that's, I think all writers have some, some of that. Um, oh. So that was a mistake because it, it, say it again, no, no. I was, I was trying to be Dennis Johnson, I think. That was my like mistake. Yeah. Oh yeah. He's, oh yeah. So that's, that's a holy thing. It means that you have a strong relation to language and you know it, you know, good stuff when you see it. But for me, it, it, it the big mistake was I wasn't, I was too scared to read myself off of that position. I didn't like to read anyone who was still alive. Uh, I, I, I read in such a narrow band and that really held me back for a long time. And um, so that was, that was a mistake. And, but then what happened was it built to a critical moment when I was I mean, already well into my thirties and we had our family where I still was not writing anything like myself. And I had that terrible feeling that all writers know where you know that you know something, you know, your life has, has been painful. Maybe it's been beautiful. But somehow none of you feel, it's almost like looking in the mirror and you don't see your actual face. Um, so that kind of built to a crisis. And then that, uh, the long delay in, in, uh, in I don't know, in, in being honest, I guess, led to a kind of an eruption that was that first book. But I don't think it would have come if I'd had some success earlier that was, you know, in my Hemingway mode, if I'd had success, I wouldn't have had the, the breakthrough. So that was one. And, you know, also, I think it's true that you're always making mistakes every day in writing. Every book has a mistake built right into it. Any, any book you can name has a built uh, tripping block. So I think part of the craft is to say, okay, in this book, what's so hard about it? Like, how could this book be terrible? You know, uh, and then you walk right up to that question and go, and I'm not going to do that, whatever it is. Like with the Lincoln book, you know, one way that book could be terrible is Lincoln. My God, who wants to write about that guy? You know, he's so, he's like on the penny. Um, but then, so part of it is to say, okay, the potential mistake is I could make a Lincoln who was too, whatever, too familiar, too cliche. Too, and, you know, in some ways, the, the, the best writing advice you can give yourself is what's the problem? And then say, don't do that, you know? That there was a, I, I knew this movie producer one time and he, he asked me to write a scene like a, I said, I don't know, you know, if I, if I, if we film wrong, it could be so cheesy. And he took a real long pause and he said, how about we don't film it wrong? <laughs> you know, so I think that mistakes are what fiction is, fiction is mistakes and then, and converting the mistakes into virtues, I guess, something like that. Um, I'm sorry, I feel like Yoda a little bit, so I don't know. If no, this is it. This is what I mean. I don't know. I know myself, but this is like <laughs> what I bought my ticket for. Um, I think, uh, <clears throat> and something you just said made me think of part of my experience in the, in the MFA, and it connects to a question that I'm looking at, which is what aspects of craftsmanship uh, will an aspiring writer learn in an MFA class that he or she will not pick up? through their own reading and practice. And I what can connect the way it connects to what you just said was um some things just happened a little bit faster. Like I like I kind of knew I was pretending, but I was like kind of hoping that no one else would know. And I remember going to um, one of Arthur's workshops. And the one time I've really gotten like really, really like, you know, <laughs> I don't know, destroyed in a workshop 
and I'm grateful for it all the time. <laughs> he saw right, right through it. And it wasn't like right through it. And I remember he went like this, like his stories, and he just like, and he uh, kind of like, he went in for a little bit about like the stories like black and it was definitely me trying to be someone else in literary and whatever that means kind of way. And um, it was called like Rise of the Destroyers, literally. And it was like a whole, but it was, cool, <laughs> but it was like, <laughs> it was it had no like humor. <laughs> and um, mm -hmm. I, that day I went home and wrote like a story, um, The Lion, the Spider. Cause like, if I'm gonna get destroyed, I'd rather be from being myself than like uh, mm -hmm. being, uh, being, I don't even know who, this guy in your MFA or whatever. Yeah. Um, but yes, yeah, so the question is, um, yeah, uh, what will an aspiring writer learn in an MFA class that he or that they will not pick up through their own reading and practice? Hmm. hmm. It's a good question, and I think we, to be honest, we have to say maybe nothing. You know, I, there's a kind of a prevailing idea that if you're a writer, you have to get an MFA. And the other is if you get the MFA, you'll automatically be a writer. And I think anyone who's around these programs know that neither one of those is actually true, you know? So I don't think we should be, especially if there's a huge amount of debt involved. I don't, I, I you know, it's not, uh, but, I, but I will say, I, I think yeah. as the years go by, wait, is that? I said like, yeah. uh, some of these <laughs> things are not ethical and that's really clear. Anyways. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, they, they, they're, they're playing on the notion that everybody has to be an artist and they're, and, you know, so that's a, another top, but I, I think, you know, as I'm teaching along, the part I really have confidence in is just that moment when, uh, I, I, I love, I love to line edit a, a student story. And especially if I know them a little bit, you know, to line edit it and then have that phone call where we sit down and I say, did those edits help? If not, that's fine. But that's a really amazing way to get a, a line on somebody's artistic personality is to line it at their work really closely and then talk to them about it. Um, it's not that they have to take it at all. That, that's not the point. The point is just to show them that, okay, actually your true voice might be here with half the sentence cut out. Or um, if, you, if you move this section over here, do you see how your causality gets stronger and then the whole thing comes off the page? Um, and then the beautiful part of that is you can then listen to what they say about it. You know, uh, that is that I think you can't get it any other any other way. And and it doesn't always happen. I mean, it's not that it's not like with every student every semester you have that moment, but every so often you do. And that I think is is really you know I think that you can't get anywhere else. Yeah, I felt super 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 lucky. I remember coming out of workshops and like, I, I mean, I would use like whichever professor was like a master copy and then incorporate all these other people's like edits and like create this master one. And then with, with your line edits, I just looked at those individually and just getting the chance to have someone attention, really close attention on your work that way is a super, it, it, it's, it's a, it's a huge blessing. And the most important one I've gotten from my intersection with uh, academia generally, I think what well, was lucky for me, um, I uh, had a professor early on, Lynn Tillman, who was pretty hardcore about her line edits. Mm. I learned to view that as like love. You know, um, I think some people yep. don't feel that and it creates a certain kind of energy with their ability to receive that. But I, yep. early on, I, I, I was like, Lynn is taking me under her wing in this like really nice way. And she like obliterates my manuscripts. So I, real, I started thinking if people mm. write on it, it's, it means that they care. And I thought that, that was big for me. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, it was interesting too, for, to, to, to work with you in that way was really was the case because um, some people are, are kind of not, they don't want to hear that. They don't want to hear notes. But, you, but when we talked, it was always fun because I could see you're hungry for it. And also we had, I felt like a kind of relationship where I could say, the outer limit of things that I thought I, I could say the things that I wasn't entirely sure about, but I could push them over to you. And if you didn't like them, you'd push them right back. And that's really a nice thing. You know, if, if somebody is just going, okay, 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 I'll do it. But if somebody's confident enough to say, no, actually there, I'm going to push back. That that's really where the, the, the cool work happens. You know, my, the thing I tell my students when I'm doing a workshop space, and it's so funny that it's, it's funny for me to even imagine having ever had done that with your edits, but, um, 
I like I, for me, I, I another thing I get to make workshop a, a, a model that works for me. I accept that the edit, the critique I do not accept is just as important as that that I do. It makes me, it, for, it forces mm. me to say uh, what you could be like nebulous and theoretical, uh, concrete in my own mind. Yeah. And so I, especially if it's people I trust. Trust. So in your case, it's like a really important one because if George says it, I still push back against it. That's very important to me, and I have to find a way to make it work. And yes. so, um, right, uh, I think uh, an approach, but that's a, that comes from like the generosity thing. I think that if you can be very generous with your, uh, I mean, still protect your work, you know, but also know that, like, uh, yeah. you are making no one can force you to do anything. That 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 felt very powerful to me. So right. from the beginning, I. I, I, I'm glad to have like really like quote unquote bad critique and, I, and that didn't happen in our sessions, but like in like maybe workshop with the group. If some, if I, if I push back really hard, like my soul is like lashes out against something. Now I'm like, oh, I discovered that I don't um, rock whatever they just said, you know? Yeah, yeah. You know, we had before your time, we had, we had a, a guest teacher come in a long time before your time. And um, I got a call that the night of the first workshop, I got a call from like three or four students. This person is so harsh. This person is telling us all these arbitrary rules and it's just, it's just like a dictatorship. We can't do it. And then I got a call from the teacher who said, boy, this group is really uh, shut down, you know? And the whole semester they fought because the teacher was having with things like um, you can't start a sentence with a proper noun, you know, all these kind of things that really weren't, defensible. But what was amazing was when I got those students the next year, they were so confident because this teacher had made them argue, you know, made them really stand up for what they believed and fight for the, made them discover their own principles, basically. So they were such a confident group and they, they uh, had really come a long way in that class. And then they never, I don't think, acknowledged that it was a great class, but it really actually was. Yeah, that's, that. It, it, it's a it's, it's a muscle to grow like your own confidence to uh and i guess that's the thing that's you want to never destroy because if you put too much pressure on a writer early they never get to grow but if you put the right amount they might really start standing in, in there in their sort of work um i think maybe I'll ask one more question i don't want to keep you forever but i am very grateful to get to be in this space um uh it's hard to choose i'm sorry if i didn't choose your story people i feel like really bad there's a lot um this one's just about writing routines uh my josh i'm interested in your writing routines uh what have you found as most productive and effective habits um does a particular day help you um you know stuff like that yeah at this point I, it's really kind of more of a mental thing like if i if i see that i have some time I just kind of something switches in my mind. I'm like, okay, now now we're in that space. Um, I mean, generally, I love to get up in the morning, take the dogs on a walk, and just work. You know, for, if I have a a day with no pressing engagements, like to just work for four or five hours in the morning is ideal. Um, but you know, the th the trick I've learned lately is that you know that feeling when you don't really want to work. Um, instead of trying to wait it out, I just recognize it. If I go to the story in progress and pull it forward and start reading it, my strong opinions will start to impel me a little bit. So I, it's now it's almost like a, a, I sit down, you know, eyeball the pages and go, all right, in a couple minutes, I'm gonna pull those over here uh, and then start. So I think, I think, but again, I think people, you know, you find your own, your own habits and um, you know, part of the, part of the whole process that we're in. And I think this is what the book is about too, is that, you know, really in writing for sure, and maybe in some larger sense, uh, the most important thing is to, is to detect your own reaction and trust it and bless it. You know, that's really what writing is, the art is. You, you, you read something you wrote yesterday, you have a reaction to it. Do you do that thing where you go, oh, no way, it was good yesterday. That's no good. Or do you say, well, I don't know anything. I'm just an idiot. You don't do that either. What you have to do basically is say, well, this is the way I feel about it today. And so I'm really going to honor that and bless it and proceed according to that. So um, I think that's, even if I don't feel like working, I'll just sometimes say, yeah, I really feel bad today. I, I have no confidence. All right, fair enough. You know, and then start. I saw Philip Seymour Hoffman once, uh, and he was talking about acting in one of those, you know, five hour Eugene O'Neill thing. 
and someone said, how do you, how do you do that? Like when you're doing two or three shows a day. And he said something like, I just, before I'm going to go on, I say, how do you feel about this? And no matter what the answer is, I accept it. And I accept it that that's a hundred percent the fuel I'm going to use to get through the performance. So if I feel like I hate acting, I hate this play, I hate this audience, you could go, okay. And he, what he said, and I, you know, I don't know. He said, is if you take that out onto the stage, at some point, that self-honesty will convert into an authentic performance uh, that somehow honors the state of mind in which you came into it. Something like that. Really. So again, you know, I am super Thank you, man. for this chance to you today. Um, uh, so much wisdom. I'm going to like, I need that playback to like take some notes. Uh, I'm super <laughs> grateful. For Thank you for who you are, Bill. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's really an honor for me. No, no, thank you for for uh, for me too. Uh, thank you. It's so, so great to see you again. And and George, thank you so much for taking the time tonight to share the launch of your book with everyone. Um, yeah, it, it was a fabulous event. Uh, and just a reminder to everyone who showed up a little bit late. Um, book the book came out today. Uh, it, if you have a shipped book, it is in the mail. If you are in Brooklyn and you selected in store pickup, head to the store and pick it up now. Uh, we're open for curbside pickup. Um, otherwise, George, Nana, be well, be safe, be sane. Uh, George, have a great rest of your events. Thank you, everybody, for being here. Nana, thank you so much. Thank you, guys. All right. Good night. Good night.